Hello, Innovation Stream friends. Innovation Stream is back, and we are thrilled to see so many familiar names in the audience today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, my name is Randy Bell, and I'm the director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. Energy Source Innovation Stream is one of the Global Energy Center, Center's signature events, where we highlight new energy technologies with the potential to reshape the global energy system. Before we get started today, I wanna to highlight a number of great essays on innovation in the publication we launched in January called The Global Energy Agenda. We're gonna put a link to that in the chat so you can read these essays that include one from Innovation Stream alum, Emily Riker. The publication also includes a survey. One of the questions we asked was, which of these energy technologies will see the greatest percentage increase in investment in 2021? You'll see hydrogen, battery storage, solar, wind, and grid modernization all at the top. Of course, we'll revisit this survey at the end of the year to see how our audience did. But for today, it's worth noting that we're going to talk about the integration of a number of these technologies. Uh, so very soon, we will be hearing from Hannah Storm Edlifsson, the Vice President of Energinet, who will discuss how Denmark is establishing the world's first energy islands. But before we, get, before we begin, several reminders. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag InnovationStream. Second, after Hannah's presentation, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. And I will try to get to as many of these as I can. If you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we can't take your questions. So. Uh, without further ado, please let me welcome Hanna to the Atlanta Council. Hanna, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Randy, for letting me present to you today. Absolutely great that you're here. You know, as we're entering the second year of the pandemic, I wanted to see how Denmark is faring and how it's changed the country's approach to energy. Yeah, good. Then I will uh, start my presentation and the main subject will be the development of energy islands and the Danish political decision to place two of them in Danish waters. Today I'll make the case that energy islands are the next and necessary step in the green transition, a vital part of the decarbonization of economies worldwide in the years to come. First, a short movie on the concept of energy islands, also called Pops and spokes. It's our future wind parks, from radial connections to individual countries, to having the North Sea countries work together by connecting the wind parks to several hubs and distribute the energy from here. With each hub having a capacity of 10 to 16 gigawatts, we can both provide the necessary connection capacity of offshore wind by 2050 and also meet the required interconnection capacity between countries to balance the excess of renewable energy produced in one country with the shortage in another. The modular hub and spoke concept provides the much needed flexibility that enables adaptation of each hub to the specific conditions of its location using either jacket-based or gravity-based structures, caisson or sand-filled islands this will be done with minimal environmental impact, always with respect for nature and local marine life. All the renewable energy produced at sea is distributed to shore and through the onshore energy infrastructure to end users across Europe. Thank you. This was an example of the concept of energy islands uh, that we have made together with our uh, colleagues in the International Consortium, where we are collaborating with both Germany and uh, the Netherlands uh, to sort of develop these hub and spoke concepts. Before we dig into uh, details and to remind ourselves of the bigger picture, I will start by taking us down memory lane. Some 30 years ago, in 1991, the German rock band Scorpions released their song Wind of Change. It soon became very popular and an anthem for the monumental changes in the world when the World War came to an end. Do you know the song? The refrain went like this. Take me to the magic of the moment. 
on a glory night where the children of tomorrow dream away in the wind of change. Back then I was a young girl, benefiting from a safe and free society, like most young people in Denmark. Scorpions wrote this song inspired from the historic and strange festival, introducing Western rock musicians in Moscow behind the Iron Curtain. This was in 1989, only a few months before the Berlin Wall went down. In Denmark, me and my family were watching the wheels of history turn, astonished, enthusiastic, and of course, listening to Scorpion's Wind of Change. Maybe it's only a poetic coincidence that 1991 was also the year when the world's first offshore wind farm was put up, in Denmark actually, and foreshadowing other winds of change. In 1991, one area ended, an area where two opposing political ideologies stopped their striving. Today, despite our still many differences, politically, ideologically, and cultural, we're all together in a very different long-term business compared to the area before 1991. Because now we're in the long-term business of replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy with the aim of safeguarding and improving the livelihoods of generations to come. So at the backdrop of the business of fighting climate change, what is the possible contribution from energy islands? I'll give you three messages to answer this question. My first key message is about radically upscaling the build out of offshore wind power. Energy islands are the next and necessary step to take. Until now, the build out of offshore wind has been done nationally and project by project. That is no real perspective of the day after tomorrow or developments next door in neighboring countries. Simply national planning and connection of one wind farm at a time. With energy islands, that is about to change. From now on, each and every energy island is spanning across borders, connecting large amounts of energy from offshore wind farms and sending it via the energy islands to more than one country, e.g. in Europe, as you saw in the movie. Why? Well, primarily because the solution offered by the concept of energy islands or energy hubs, as you also might call them, is in effect a pure necessity. Earlier I mentioned the world's first offshore wind farm in Denmark. It was decommissioned in 2017, and in all its lifetime, dating back to 91, it produced the same amount of power that only seven of the largest offshore windmills today produce in a single year. Radical technological, structural and economic improvements have materialized over the years. Now we need to push forward similar improvements of the speed and the volumes of the deployment of offshore wind capacity. Today, the growth rate of offshore wind capacity in the North Sea alone is two gigawatts a year. That is not near enough to reach Europe's commitments under the Paris Agreement. For that, we need approximately seven gigawatts per year. This is not going to happen if we do not change gears from national deployment to international and energy islands. My second key message is that energy islands are important part of the hydrogen value change. Wind of change is an appropriate keyword for a massive upscaling of offshore wind capacity. Perhaps then another line from the refrain that I quoted for you earlier is appropriate for our next subject. Take me to the magic of the moment, Scorpion sang. Recently, I discovered that a common joke among energy professionals goes like this. Hydrogen is the future source of energy, and it always will be. 
Funny indeed, since we have all talked about power to X and hydrogen for ages. And even a few years ago, it might no, not even be so easily dismissed. But today, I'm sure, as your um, survey also showed, any foresighted leader or politician recognize the change that we are already experiencing in this field. As for hydrogen and power to X, we have now arrived at the magic of the moment. I am very sure of that. Although to set the magic free, it requires strong cooperation between different stakeholders um, that plan the energy infrastructure of tomorrow. In Denmark, we estimate that hydrogen and green fuels from power to X could reduce daily CO2 emissions with 2.5 million tons before 2030, but with a significant increase in reduction potentially shortly hereafter. Um, already now, we power more than 50% of our electricity consumption with just wind and sun power. And in 2030, that number will be 100%. You need to compare this with the fact that even in the future and fully electrified Denmark, the vast wind energy resources in the Danish North Sea alone could meet our electricity consumptions more than three times. That is also why we prepare for production of hydrogen and power to X, where the energy islands will be connected to land. We need to plan for large surplus amounts of energy from offshore wind to both need the meet, meet the needs for electrification and for climate neutral fuels produced with hydrogen and power to X. After all, it is only around 60% of our total energy consumption that can be directly electrified. The remaining 40% can be indirectly electrified through power to air conversion, making it possible to drive and fly on wind, indeed a wind of change. My third and last message is that energy islands are a move to international solutions. Take me to the magic of the moment on a glory night where the children of tomorrow share their dreams. So goes another variant of the refrain in the anthem by Scorpions. Energy islands are a very definite move towards international solutions, towards sharing our dreams beyond national borders. Courage is needed by all of us, including sometimes traditionalistic oriented TSOs as in Guinness. And to say that energy islands are international and dangerous is not to say that we do not need bold initiatives from single partners. We do need that. The Danish political agreement about energy islands was signed by a broad majority in the parliament. In the agreement, it is stated that both energy islands should be connected to other countries. It is far to acknowledge that political capital is at stake in first mover initiatives like the energy islands but there's no straightforward recipe that would guarantee success. I'm happy to note that there are now genuine international movement and interest. Proof of this is the recent understandings between Denmark and the Netherlands, Germany and Belgium to work together and analyze perspectives of connecting the energy islands to multiple countries while sharing the benefits. But there is still a long way to go. I will now show you a few slides with the concrete steps of the world's first energy islands in the Danish waters. First of all, where are we? Um, we are in the North Sea, where there's a plan to build an artificial island with three gigawatts offshore wind by uh, 33, later at least up to 10 gigawatts. And then we're in the Baltic Sea uh, on an already existing island called Bornholm beautiful holiday spot uh, with two gigawatts offshore wind by 2030. Uh, the possible interconnectors um, in the North Sea could be, as I told you, to Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium, where we already have agreed upon to calculate and look at, at uh, interconnectors. But it could also be to UK or Norway, or as you saw in the movie, it could be to another hub and then connecting to other countries. With regards to 
um, the Baltic Sea. We have an agreement with Germany to look upon a interconnector there, but also to Sweden and Poland. It could be uh, in the near future an idea to connect. Uh, deep diving into the uh, North Sea, uh, I would like to tell you that it's already been decided that it should be a case on construction. This is just an image showing how it could look. The uh, island will be a public-private partnership. Um, and as I told you before, the modularity approach means that we can go from actually uh, supplying from three up to 10 million European households with green energy in the future. The total costs is, are estimated to uh, 28 billion euros uh, with all the installations and also the wind farms. So this is a huge project, the biggest project we've ever had in Denmark. If you would like to follow our work, um, you can follow both the North Sea Wind Power Hub on developing the concept and of course, in again, it and uh, the developing the uh, specific Danish energy islands as it is for now. So I'll slightly go back without slides and say that my last remark should be that uh, we should resonate with the theme of sharing dreams with each other for the sake of the business that we're in together, all of us, meaning replacing fossil fuels renewable energy. So thank you very much. And uh, I certainly wish that uh, a lot of us and also the young people can enjoy life in a safe and free environment um, while listening to the winds of change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I've asked uh, our AV team if we can end with uh, the Scorpions for our theme instead of our normal theme music, but unfortunately, because of copyright, we're not allowed to. So I just hope oh. that everybody can sort of hum along in their heads and think about that. Um, we have, uh, we're already starting to get questions in the Q&A, um, and I know that there are going to be a lot of them, so I want to move quickly to that. I want to take the, the first one from uh, Elliot Roseman, uh, who asks, how do you see the role of distributed generation and how does Denmark plan to integrate offshore wind and energy islands with more local generation, energy efficiency, et cetera? Uh, I think this whole transition of the energy sector is not a question of uh, one thing or one technology uh, or one grip in, in the toolbox. Uh, it's, it's both, it's all of it. So we are both looking at uh, energy efficiency a lot in Denmark, uh, and we're also looking at um, near shore wind, solar power on, uh, on land, and of course uh, the offshore wind. We just have a lot of offshore resources, and uh, well, we need to share that with others that don't have the same amount of, uh, of resources. So that's the thought of this. Got it, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, a question for me on investment, um, and how thinking through this, um, you, the, you said that the, the energy islands will be a public private sector uh, uh, partner partnership. Um, how do you see that collaboration working? How does the investment of the project break down? We don't have all the details yet, but um, let me first say that the, the public private ownership will be on the island only, meaning that there will be a public private sort of landlord uh, having the keys and renting out uh, to the rest of us who need to be on the island. You could have O&M activities, you could have laboratories, you could have maybe a few areas while you uh, put up um, uh, a lot of the gear uh, for people for living. Uh, aviation could be also small, harbor, et cetera, as you maybe saw on the image. So there will be a lot of commercial activities uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the, the key infrastructure from, from our side, from Inneginet's side. Um, so this public-private ownership will be a landlord who has to make sort of his or her own business case on the island. Um, Got it. Got it. So you have the public-private partnership, but you also have, you're also coordinating with multiple countries. And how, oh. how does that coordination work? Are there any challenges with international cooperation? Well, I, I think this is one of the, the most difficult things because we are used to these uh, more radial outbuilds of, of wind farms. 
Um, but we also have experiences and, and we're quite well connected already in Denmark because we're situated sort of in the middle. Uh, so, so we have a, a situation now where we have several connections to other countries. And um, we are the ones who are sort of trying to, to make these agreements, but they of course also need to be uh, underlined and cleared politically. So it's, it's both a, a matter of TSOs like us shaking hands, but it's definitely also uh, on the political side that we have ministers looking at each other and saying, I want to make an agreement with you. We will share our renewable resources. And, and is that going, going well? Do you, th- do you see that as, as ultimately all going to work out? I, well, I, I am a key optimist, so so I hope so. And I also have we have a lot of uh, very positive um, um, interests already. Uh, we have uh, on government side already uh, agreements with three countries to look at this. But of course, we still need that final decision. Uh, so the next year or so, we will be looking into more studies before having an actual agreement. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, Michelle, uh, I'm going to butcher this last name. Apologies. Michelle Krajveld asks, uh, within the North Sea Alliance, a fully new offshore grid will have to be developed to act as an interconnector. What's the planning for this massive operation? That's a very good question, because that's also one of the crucial things that we have to look upon together, which is already stated by the European Commission, etc., that this is so important that we do that. And if we don't collaborate, we will all be building on each other's, which will make a massive impact on environment. Uh, And that is also why uh, we have uh, sort of introduced one of these uh, uh, ideas with the energy islands, because if you use the energy islands, you will have uh, the interconnectors both transmission and also being sort of the marketplace to sell the, the uh, renewable energy. So hopefully by by doing this and by coordinating in it internationally, we will uh, save some money, we will still have high energy of supply, and we can also um, uh, sort of lower the impact on the environment. Got it, got it. Um, you mentioned hydrogen uh, as as you know the fuel of, of the future, the, the the ever evolving 10 years out. Um, the joke is actually er, even earlier that fusion is the fuel of the future and is always 30 years away. But but a question, we're doing a lot of work on hydrogen at the Atlantic Council. Um, how do you see how do you see hydrogen fitting in in the short term, given that the cost of electrolyzers, while while definitely coming Definitely, we're seeing the cost curve. We're seeing it move down the cost curve. How do you see electrolyzers fitting in now versus in five or ten years when we project uh, the cost will be much, much lower? Yeah. Well, with relations to the energy islands, uh, we will see um, onshore uh, um, industries. Uh, you will have the power coming in, and then you'll see it uh, in. Uh, close to district heating systems, etc., so that you can s- still sell surplus heating, which is a lot of when you have uh, the coercion of, of of the power. But later on, I, I foresee that we will have um, a direct um, production of, of hydrogen uh, on the energy islands, and maybe even you know sort of um, sending it in into shore um, from the islands, or having, for instance, um, aviation or ships sort of tanking up out there on the islands. So there are different views depending on on the time frame. Got it, okay, uh, very interesting. Uh, we have a qu- another question from the audience from Henrik Eckert Sabra, who asks, uh, except, uh, except from the electrical power hub and power to X, what other advantages could there could we see in relation to energy islands? Um, search and rescue hubs, fishing, environmental, mar- marine, aggregate extraction and refinement. So how, how do you see these islands having any additional use uh, beyond the energy portion you've talked about? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it's definitely also uh, when we when we are watching, for instance, in the North Sea, there are a lot of other activities going on there and it's very far from shore. So it could be other uh, O&M activities like the ones mentioned. It will not be scuba diving or casinos. Uh, it's it's not that kind of an environment and it's it's too expensive to build caissons also having uh, hotels, etc. So it's not at all that, but it's all the other stuff that we are already doing out there, but where we can shorten sort of uh, an efficient, also do it more efficient, but also shorten time, for instance, uh, in other related uh, industries. 
Got it. Looking into a massive build out from three gigawatts to 10 gigawatts also means that you have a long construction period. Uh, so it's not only maintenance, but also several years of construction. Fantastic. Um, so, so this is a first of a kind project. Um, how could this initiative, if it's, if it's successful, be replicated in other areas around the world? What and what countries do you think might have the most potential and could gain the most by developing uh, this this concept? I think we will all be uh, in a situation where we will need a lot more power than we can imagine now. That is also what every survey says, every study says. So if we look into that, way more power, both directly and indirectly, is needed than any area that has offshore wind uh, by the west, uh, not only to oneself, but other, uh, also being able to share it to others and maybe connecting to other areas of the world where they have a different pattern of, of production of renewables, then it, this will be helpful. That is the way we see it and, and how the first studies have been showing us in the North Sea Wind Power Hub. So we have mainly focused on, on the North Sea until now, and then recently in Denmark also on the Baltic Sea. But I see this being able to be copied in other areas of the world also, uh, where you have vast um, uh, resources of uh, offshore wind. Got it. Okay, one, one final question uh, coming in uh, from the audience. Um, and uh, this is from, uh, well, it's it's from somebody whose name, la I believe last name is Ihorn, um, and and they ask, what is the environmental impact of the artificial island construction itself and the infrastructure, cables, et cetera? I know you mentioned, the, the, the video mentioned that it will minimize the environmental impact, but wondering how you're thinking about that and, how, and actually how you do, how you minimize it. Yeah, Th this is of course one of the key issues that we're looking upon and we have already started in Denmark uh, locally uh, the, all, all uh, the necessary um, uh, checks to make sure that it's, it's, this is doable and, and to do it the, the most um, uh, careful way because it will of course impact nature but it, it will impact nature less than what we are comparing if we are to, to to sort of continue with oil and gas. And that is always uh, what we should have in mind when we're talking about wind, that yes, it will disturb the nature, but it will disturb the nature less than continuing with fossil fuels. I think that's a wonderful way to end. Um, Hannah, thank you so much uh, for this presentation. Uh, it's a really remarkable concept and we're looking forward to following it uh, here at the Atlanta Council. I think this presentation was really great for those who care about uh, climate action, but also uh, appeals to those who are interested in uh, 1980s hair bands. Um, so that's a innovation stream. Um, so Hannah, thank you and make sure everyone in the audience to connect with Hannah on LinkedIn or follow her on Twitter at HS Edelsen. Um, and I think, Hannah, you'll tweet about wind, offshore wind, uh, energy islands, and the scorpions. Um, uh, our next innovation stream will be with uh, Kamal Hassamgotoglu, who is the, ex I'm sorry about that, just butchering that name, um, who's the executive director for the Versatile Test Reactor Project at the Idaho, Idaho National Labs. Uh, this episode is scheduled for April 9th, so watch this space. There might be another innovation stream before then. Uh, you can also join the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center for other events this week. Uh, we'll be hosting an event with the Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute, uh, a report launched to evaluate opportunities for nuclear cooperation between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea. That's tomorrow, March 3rd at 6 p.m. Eastern. We're also hosting a virtual event to discuss the architecture for Red Plus transactions, a Paris Agreement aligned platform that aims to redirect large scale private finance to jurisdictional scale Red Plus, Red Plus programs. That's this Friday, March 5th at noon Eastern. Thank you for everyone who helped put this event together, including Maria Castillo, Zainab Wiren, Jackson Styron, and Olga Kokova. This presentation will be available on the Atlantic Council website, YouTube channel, Facebook, and Twitter. Please share it with your colleagues. Uh, Hannah, thank you so much again for joining us. And everyone in the audience, thank you for being a loyal follower of Innovation Stream. We'll see you again next time.